Okay, so uh, I guess we can start uh, and uh, and go over this project that I have on uh, on maritime piracy. Um, so uh, I've been working on this project for about four years. Uh, this is a project that was uh, funded up until just uh, the end of this last year, 2017, by the Office of Naval Research um, through the Minerva Initiative. Um, and I have a co-author, who's uh, Ursula Daxter, who's a student of mine uh, a number of years ago, but she's now at Amsterdam. Um, and uh, this project uh, began um, as an effort to really map pirate attacks worldwide and to largely explain the structural conditions that are associated with modern maritime piracy. Um, so we wanted to get an idea of where piracy was happening and, and why, um, and to collect data on, uh, with geolocation information uh, on, on where these things were, were going on. Um, now one of the questions might be why, why study this, and of course there is a long-term his historical fascination uh, with, uh, with piracy. Obviously a lot of people find piracy interesting and fascinating. Uh, there's certainly uh, a, um, an idea that pirates stick it to the man, they, uh, they steal money from the rich and give it to somebody else. Uh, there, uh, there is this idea that, uh, that, that pirate life is a life of adventure, uh, and that there's a certain liberation from societal norms. Uh, and so we see all of these kind of accounts when looking at historical piracy. Um, but there are real costs uh, to piracy that we see today. Um, and so, uh, you know, the OBP, so uh, the uh, Oceans Beyond Piracy, which is a, it's a, an organization that's affiliated with the One Earth Foundation, which is located in Denver, Colorado. They have this piracy organization. So it's funny because it's in Denver, Colorado, as far away from the ocean as possible. Uh, but they have this great organization that studies, that studies modern maritime piracy. And they estimated that the cost to the international community at the height of the Somali piracy, which we're talking about 2010, um, was somewhere between seven and $12 billion to the international community. Right? Uh, and this is not only from uh, just the cost in terms of cargo that's stolen or a ship that's been hijacked or both of those uh, costs uh, involved in, uh, uh, in ransom, sailors that are, uh, that are kidnapped and ransomed off, but also the indirect costs that result uh, from uh, what are uh, naval operations, uh, higher insurance rates, and these kinds of things right, that are affected by piracy. So th the costs are not <coughs> insignificant. They have decreased since the height of the Somali piracy, but they're not insignificant costs. And the international community uh, certainly became concerned um, during Somali piracy about these costs. Uh, and so one of the reasons you see a concerted effort to address Somali piracy was in part because of these, uh, rising, uh, these rising costs. But piracy also kind of gets at these, this, this, these twin tre trends in international relations. One of them is globalization, right? So this interconnectedness that appears to be happening among states and communities. And that certainly produced what are increases in, uh, in financial investment into countries, produced large increases in global trade, most of which, of course, happens on the ocean in these TEUs, 20 equivalent foot units, right? Those big container ships, containers that are on these ships, right? Um, uh, and so we've, we've seen a dramatic increase in the amount of trade and all of this uh, on, the o on the open ocean. Uh, and of course, this provides opportunities uh, for individuals that may uh, want to get rich uh, attacking ships. But at the same time as we have this globalization, we have this localization that's happening as well. Um, and in part, this localization is a product of globalization uh, that uh, local communities have been negative, uh, negatively affected by liberalization in, in economies, um, both in terms of uh, jobs switching to uh, different uh, to different industries, uh, leading to uh, what is joblessness in certain communities, um, leading to uh, what happened to have been liberalization in uh, in uh, in regimes, uh, which has produced uh, corruption. Um, and so we have this localization as individual communities seek greater control locally at the same time as we have this greater uh, connectedness um, at, the at the international level, right? And then one of the other reasons that I think is interesting is that there hasn't been a lot of systematic comparative research on modern maritime piracy. So we have a number of case studies on certain countries that have piracy, Somalia, of course, being uh, the one that everybody thinks of. Um, but before Somalia, there was Indonesia, and Indonesia was the locus of uh, maritime piracy for a number of years, and so we have a number of scholars who have directly interviewed pirates 
uh, in Somalia, to, uh, sorry, in Indonesia to understand what's driving some of their actions uh, and what has produced uh, increased attacks uh, in, in Indonesia as well, right? So one of the reasons we want to get into this is just in part because uh, we thought we could actually model piracy better than what had been done. So had been little cross-national work. We thought we could actually do this cross-nationally and try to understand what are the general drivers, structural conditions that are associated with modern maritime piracy. Um, so the, 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 the basic puzzle um, that we're interested in is that there are these uh, effects at the state level and at the local level. So piracy, like a lot of other things that uh, I look at as well, such as uh, civil war and terrorism, uh, it's impacted by state capacity. So it is found in weak states, right? Um, uh, but one of the things that we, we notice and one of the weaknesses of a lot of research that looks at state weakness and some of the associated uh, processes that are affected by state weakness um, is that states are not uniformly strong or weak within a country. I mean, a country is uh, a large geographical unit and so states may be strong in some locations and weak in other locations, right? And so a measure of state capacity or state strength, how strong regimes are, does not necessarily tell us how strong they are in certain places within a country, right? So you may be strong in one place and weak in another place. Um, and what we see is that although piracy does associate with state weakness, it doesn't tell us where within states pirates may locate, right? So we may have, so obviously something like Somalia, Pirates are not uniformly located along the, uh, the, uh, the western Indian Ocean region of Somalia, right? They're actually located in certain places and not others. And so the, 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 to understand piracy, we needed to actually dig deep within states, model it subnationally to understand what are the conditions locally that may be influencing piracy and how those conditions associate with uh, national level conditions to help produce pirate action groups and pirate attacks. Right, so one of the things that we're looking at is, uh, is and basically the puzzle is, um, is that yes, state weakness is a necessary condition, generally speaking, for pirates to emerge, to emerge, but they don't then associate or live or go to the strongest places within these weak countries. Uh, and one of the things we also note is that there are these twin conditions that pirates need. Pirates need both governance and they also need infrastructure for their their business model to actually be effective, for it to actually make money. So you need certain amount of stability, and you also need access to what is transportation infrastructure, communication infrastructure, financial infrastructure, for this predatory criminal activity to actually uh, make money, for it to actually be, uh, to be uh, effective. All right, so this map just, it, we, I put this together just to give you an idea of the intuition behind the uh, uh, the puzzle itself, right? So this obviously is the, the island of Sumatra in, uh, in Indonesia, um, and so Singapore, this is the Aceh region uh, down here, Jakarta uh, on Java is down here, this is uh, Kalimantan, right? Um, and so what, we, what, we're gonna, what, we're, what I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna show um, is that given a, the pirate need for both infrastructure and governance, that is governance in the form that actually can produce or build the roads and infrastructure needed for pirate activity to actually be successful to take place, that is for criminal groups to actually scale up their activities for it to be a sophisticated organized criminal operation, they need a certain amount of transportation communication infrastructure. They need elites to help provide that, but they also need elites that can actually be bought off, right? So we don't expect piracy to emerge in the strongest areas within a country or the weakest areas within a country. There is a certain sweet spot where pirates locate in part because there is transportation infrastructure, there is critical infrastructure that allows their business model, their activities to actually be successful to take, uh, to, uh, uh, to be effective. Uh, but there also are elites there that are, that are weak enough they can be bought off. And so we expect to see, and this is what we see here, this is just a measure of, of night lights. And so it's not in the strongest areas, it's in these moderate areas in which we actually see the emergence of these uh, pirate action groups. So this is actually taken from news reports from 2000, I guess, 10, 16, in which we just collected information on where pirate action groups were located. They tend to be located uh, not in the strongest areas, not in the weakest areas, but areas in which there's moderate governance uh, and uh, transportation and communication infrastructure. So we're interested in exploring what are these subnational conditions that are associated with pirate attacks and where pirate, group, pirate groups locate. All right, so I can't get away with uh, talking about the, the Marisk, Alabama incident. Um, so uh, 
one of the, the, the event that triggered the project itself was, of course, the attack against the Maersk Alabama, which happened in April of 2009, right? So this is the Captain Phillips uh, event. Um, and um, the, 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 the Maersk Alabama uh, was actually traveling from the Salala port in Oman to Djibouti, and then it was actually going around the Horn of Africa and going down to Mombasa um, to transport uh, food for the World, uh, World Food Program. Um, well, this happened in, in April of 2009. 2009 was not the year in which we see the most amount of piracy. That actually was 2011. It wasn't even the second year. That was actually 2000. Um, it was probably, I think, the fifth or sixth highest year in terms of total number of attacks we see globally uh, in 2009. But one of the things that we did see in 2009 and 2008, and then right after the attack um, against the Maersk Alabama, um, was... A, uh, a number of very high profile attacks against very large uh, cargo ships, oil tankers, right? Um, and this began to get security experts interested in, in what was happening with piracy, uh, especially in this region of the world, although also in, uh, in Indonesia as well. But it was this part of the world in which we were seeing these dramatic attacks on the open ocean, on the open water, uh, by these uh, pirates in small skiffs that would board these ships, uh, they would actually uh, take control of the vessel. They would actually uh, they would sail it to the uh, the Somali coastline. They would uh, ram it uh, onto the ocean, and they would then uh, they would then ransom the ship and the crew for for millions of dollars. Um, but one of the attacks was actually against the MV Fena, uh, which is a Ukrainian cargo ship, and it was actually and this was in 2008. It was carrying 33 T Soviet T72 tanks. Uh, and a lot of ammunition as well. And it was actually going to Kenya. And this was actually taken by Somali pirates. And so individuals in the security community got concerned about, well, what are we transporting on ships? And, and where are these weapons going to go for transporting them? Are pirates going to actually give these to uh, either insurgent groups in countries in West Africa that we don't want to have them, or to, to terrorist organizations, maybe Al-Shabaab in, uh, in, uh, in Somalia, uh, or a, 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 an ISIS affiliate uh, in some other place? So uh, the MV Fena got a lot of people really concerned about piracy. There also was an attack in 2011 against the MV Irene, another large, huge cargo ship that was carrying $200 million worth of uh, crude oil, uh, and it was taken by pirates in 2011. 2011 also, uh, which actually got uh, Obama interested in piracy. I wouldn't say interested, but it got, it got piracy notice in the Obama administration. There actually was a 58-foot sailing ship, of w which uh, four Americans were sailing around the world, and it was actually seized by Somali pirates, uh, and all four Americans were, were murdered by Somali pirates. And this reached the highest echelons of the Obama administration. And so the Obama administration began uh, to get uh, involved uh, uh, in, in maritime piracy as well. Uh, there was another ship in 2010 uh, that was, uh, uh, it was a, a large crude oil tanker that was heading to Louisiana, New Orleans. Um, and it was, it was seized as well. Now, the FANA got like, the pirates got $2 million. The MV Irene, got, they got $3 million for ransoming that ship. This other one in 2010 that was going to Louisiana, they got $10 million for the ship. Now, again, remember that per capita GDP in Somalia is something like $250 uh, per year, right? So these are, the, for these types of awards were dramatic uh, and extremely large. Um, and this really, this really captivated the attention of the international community and got the international community uh, actually concerned. There also was this large increase in hijackings that was going on at the same time. So these attacks were, were just symptomatic of a trend in piracy that was going on in the Western Indian Ocean, right? So in 2000, uh, I, I want to say 2006 or so, uh, there was something like six hijackings. There was like 14 in 2007. This jumped to 48 hijackings in 2000. 8, 49 in 2009, over 50 uh, in 2010, right? So this is the time when security experts are getting very concerned uh, about maritime piracy uh, and cost of the global community and what's actually being stolen in these attacks. And of course, um, as the size of the ship and the amount of money that's involved in some of these ships, international shipping companies get involved, concerned. Uh, insurance companies uh, be, become increasingly concerned uh, about these types of attacks because they are, of course, pushing up the costs uh, of shipping. Um, now, the, the Maersk Alabama was a 500 foot long ship that was, like I said, going from Oman to Mombasa in Kenya, and it was carrying food supplies for the World, World Food Program. It, would see, it was seized right here, about 450 nautical miles off the Somali coast. It was being seized by isle based pirates. So, this is the Puntland region of, uh, of Somalia, and this is, of course, where piracy was most entrenched. 
uh, in terms of pirate action groups. There was some piracy down here. There was very little up here, but most of it was up in Puntland region or very south uh, uh, below uh, uh, the capital city. Um, and um, the, the, the pirates seized the ship on April 8th, I think, uh, of 2009. The attack lasted four days. Uh, there was a, dist a distress call that was made uh, to, uh, uh, naval forces that were in the area, the U.S. Bainbridge, which is a missile destroyer, actually shows up. As we know from the movie, four pirates were involved in this attack. Three were killed uh, by Navy snipers. One actually was captured, went back to the United States, put on trial for piracy, and is actually sitting in an American jail uh, for, uh, for uh, 30 years. Um, and uh, this attack gets us interested because we actually, one, this received enough attention that uh, it came across many people's desks. Um, and it came across my desk, and what was interesting about this attack, because I had not focused much on maritime piracy, um, but the, the story came with um, a link to an organization that, connect, that collects data on maritime piracy. So there's a lot of interest in the relationship between crime and political institutions, right? How do political institutions affect rates of kind of predatory mafia-style crime in, in countries? Um, and we have a lot of like single country studies, Italy, United States, right, Russia, places in which you see these kind of mafia style criminal organizations that engage in this criminal activity, right? Um, but the problem is it's hard to get cross national overtime data on these predatory criminal organizations, the type of activities they're engaged in, right? What this organization did, which is the IMB, the International Maritime Bureau, which is a, it's an arm of the International Chamber of Commerce is it provided us with cross-national overtime data on counts of pirate attacks worldwide, right? So it provided exactly the kind of data that we'd like to have on crime, which is to understand how crime is moving spatially and how it's moving temporally, right? And so this began this project in which uh, we could begin to use this data to build cross-national data sets and overtime data sets to explore uh, variation uh, and what are the factors that associate with, uh, uh, with uh, this type of violence, right? All right, so what do we know about, uh, about, uh, about piracy, right? So I'll show you a little bit, a few maps in just a second on location, overtime trends that we see in pirate activity cross-nationally, globally speaking, right? But there are basically four factors that we know associate fairly strongly with maritime piracy. One is state weakness, and this actually is where we make a contribution as well, right? So this project um, uh, started as an, uh, as an effort to, to map pirate attacks, that is to geocode where these, uh, these attacks were occurring, um, and then to try to understand what are the structural conditions associated with them. Um, but it's, it's morphed into trying to understand what are the sub-national conditions that are associated with pirate attacks in certain countries world, worldwide, right? And so what we want to actually uh, uh, make a contribution to, and we actually have a book manuscript that we're just finishing up with, is to understand what are some of the sub-national institutional effects that drive piracy uh, in, in subnational locations in a number of countries, right? So we know that state weakness matters. In fact, the, the, the factor that is most commonly cited as driving maritime piracy is state weakness, right? Um, this is where we see piracy. These are the countries we see it, and it's in fact because of state weakness uh, that, uh, that piracy has emerged, right? But we also know that political violence associates with piracy as well, right? There is a connection between insurgencies or armed rebellion and piracy. And we've actually done a little bit of work on this, just to try to understand what the connections between piracy and insurgency are. And we do find that pirates are sometimes insurgents as well, they're rebels, so they actually serve in two roles. They sometimes serve as foot soldiers in rebel groups, but they also serve as pirates in political action groups as well, and they kind of go back and forth between them. Uh, and we also uh, find out that Many rebel organizations use piracy as a way of raising resources to help fund their anti-state campaigns. Um, and so we actually connect piracies to uh, a literature on, uh, on resources and conflict. So we know that a variety of resources associate with the onset of armed conflict and the duration of armed conflict at the sub-state level. Um, things like oil, alluvial diamonds, illicit narcotics, uh, things like this. You can, all of these resources tend to associate with the onset of armed conflict and the duration of armed conflict as well. Piracy is one of those. So where you see political violence, armed rebellion, you also see frequently piracy as well. There are economic motivations that drive piracy 
as well as you might expect. So there are grievances. You can look at this as GDP per capita, joblessness. One of the strongest correlates of piracy, of course, relates to the fishing industry. There is an increase in IUU fishing, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. Um, that is foreign fishing fleets that enter the waters um, of, uh, of weak states uh, and actually steal what are the, the, marine, uh, the marine life um, of, these, uh, of these states. This drives many fishers into other, uh, 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 other employment options because they can't fish anymore. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the explanations for the increase in Somali piracy, which isn't exactly the best explanation, but it's one that actually does, uh, that it does explain some of the, the increase in piracy we, uh, we see, is that a lot of foreign fishing fleets enter the waters of Somalia, in part because the Somali state was so weak, right? I mean, it collapsed after the Bari regime uh, collapsed in 1991, um, and so there was really no effective government that could challenge any, any foreign fishing vessel that might actually enter the waters of Somalia. There was nobody that would challenge it, um, and in fact, many fishermen became pirates in part to scare off what was uh, what were these foreign fishing fleets, but still there are these economic motivations that drive that drive piracy um, that we see as well. And then of course there's geography. Uh, piracy doesn't happen in landlocked states as you might expect. It happens in literal states. Um, uh, now it is in fact. Um, more widespread than people think. So about 60% of literal countries have experienced at least one pirate attack. But of course it is concentrated as well geographically. So 70% of the pirate attacks we see from 93 to 2016 um, are accounted for by seven states in the international system, right? So a lot of it is very concentrated around the Indian Ocean uh, and the Malacca Straits region, uh, but still South America experienced it, the United States actually has experienced it uh, as well. Uh, there actually is uh, uh, piracy in the Mediterranean, even if the vast majority of piracy we see is in the Indian Ocean uh, and in Southeast Asia. So in terms of trends uh, that we see in trying to describe piracy over time, so this is how it's looked, right? Virtually nothing. Now this doesn't mean there was nothing, it just means there was nobody collecting data <laughs> at this point. Uh, and so we have very little information. Back before 1980, there is a... Uh, uh, and a bureau, an office within the U.S. Navy that has collected data, and they have at least some data going back to 1978, but it's really spotty and doesn't really help us, right? So data collection really began in the 1990s with the IMB, but also other organizations as well. And so we see this trend over time. And this is all incidents, then we have steaming incidents and incidents that happen at anchor uh, or at port, right? So this increase is driven by Indonesia. This is where most of it was happening in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And there's a drop off, and this of course increased right here is Somali-based piracy that increases it again. Uh, so one of the goals of the project was to curate data from different organizations, right? So um, there actually are three primary organizations that collect data on piracy, globally speaking. So the one I mentioned was the IMB. Um, and this does cl collect data, but it's self-reported data, right? So somebody from a ship actually has to call this organization and say, we were attacked by pirates, okay? So it's, it's, it's certainly one bit of information, uh, but it doesn't get at whether or not somebody on a ship doesn't want to report that, and there are certainly reasons to believe that somebody might not want to report an attack against a ship, right? Now again, a hijacking, <laughs> I, I, I'm confident those numbers are probably pretty accurate uh, because if a ship's hijacked, uh, you clearly want to report it. But if it's an attempted attack, if it's a, a, a small attack that results in the stolen ropes uh, or communication equipment or something, it may not get attacked because there may be, in fact, be a cost uh, uh, in terms of actually having to report this and a variety of other things that come with actually reporting an incident. So, so there clearly is an undercounting based on self-reporting, right? But there are two other organizations that actually collect data too. The IMO, International Maritime uh, Organization, it, which is an arm of the United Nations, collects data on it. These two organizations uh, are very close in terms of their numbers, but we also have this other organization which is uh, uh, actually, that's not the organization. The organization is, uh, is a U.S. geospatial intelligence organization within the Department of Defense. Um, and it collects this data called, uh, called ASOM, which is the Anti-Shipping Activity Messaging System. And this is, uh, it, it, it uses a lot more sources to collect data, not just self-reporting. So it doesn't have to be self-reported for them to actually record this information. Uh, so we tend to have more uh, incidents recorded by ASOM. Uh, but one of the goals of the project was actually to, to go through these, uh, these, these three co data collection efforts um, and to see how much they overlapped 
and then to build a comprehensive data set of all the unique incidents to these three, to these three organizations. And it does provide a rather large increase from what was uh, the scholarly count to the accounts that were provided just by IMB that everybody used, right? So we would get, I think we have, using these two other sources, we've increased the number of piracy incidents probably by about 30 or 35%. So it's fairly significant. Um, and again, over this period of time from 93, I think, to 2016, although we do have 2017 data too, um, we have close to 9,000 attacks. Um, so this meant that we increased by somewhere in the range of 3,000 incidents by, by actually looking at these three organizations. Right? So this has actually helped us to provide a, a, a better understanding and a better picture of where piracy is happening. So this is what it looks like geospatially. Right? And this is using all attacks over this period of time. Uh, as you can see, Western Indian Ocean, Somali piracy, uh, Indonesia, Straits of Malacca, right? Of course, South America, we have some piracy. The other hotspot right over here, of course, is Nigeria in the, in the Gulf of Guinea that we see a lot of piracy uh, attacks as well. Uh, Bangladesh has a ton of piracy. Um, so the seven, I think the seven, the, the seven states that account for 7% of the piracy, of course, Somalia, Indonesia, Nigeria, Malaysia, Bangladesh, India, and then China. Uh, although Chinese pi pi piracy uh, uh, went away after the 1990s. Uh, but still, this is what it looks like. This provides another look, which is just a heat map, um, which gives you some idea of where the hotspots are. Um, and so clearly Gulf of Guinea, obviously the Gulf of Aden, right? And this is down uh, uh, in uh, south of, uh, uh, of uh, Kenya. Uh, and piracy actually was coming from the southern, uh, southern Somalia. This is Sri Lanka. There was a lot of piracy that was associated with uh, what was the rebellion by the Tamils against the government in Sri Lanka. Uh, and the Tamil Tigers actually engaged in extensive piracy to help fund their anti-state campaign against the, uh, the Sri, Lankan, uh, Sri Lankan regime. And then, of course, we see a lot of piracy throughout the Indonesian archipelago. Right? This, is, uh, this gives you a picture of, uh, of what piracy, uh, piracy looks like. Um, okay, so the argument that, that is the basis for this book manuscript um, that is an extension of the, of the project. I mean, the project wasn't, it wasn't focused subnationally originally uh, when it was funded. It was largely just to provide a data set of pirate incidents that ONR wanted, uh, and then they wanted some idea of where piracy was happening, what are some of the structural conditions that were associated with it, right? But the book itself, as we, as we, as we got into the project, we realized that if we really wanted to understand where pirates were locating, we needed to actually understand what was happening on the ground within these countries, right? Um, and, and what we found was that state weakness or state capacity matters a great deal. In fact, structurally speaking, that's cross-nationally speaking, the factor that matters the most when it comes to piracy, other than geography, uh, is state capacity, right? Um, it's the strongest relationship that we actually, uh, we actually see associated with modern maritime piracy, right? Um, now we have a number of, uh, 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 we, have a, 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 we have a variety of work that also has looked at piracy. We're not the only ones to look at piracy, although we're the only ones to look at it both cross-nationally and sub-nationally and try to understand what are the implications of both a weak state and what are governance areas within weak states to understand better where within weak states pirates are actually locating, right? So we have this work by Justin Hastings uh, who, uh, uh, who looks at state strength and, and finds that they're, uh, they're there is this relationship between state capacity and piracy in part because pirates are fleeing from state capacity. They're fleeing from the authoritative capacity of states to actually seek out uh, and capture uh, these criminals uh, and incarcerate them. Um, we actually have this work um, by Anya Shortland and Federico Varese. He does work on, on, uh, on, mafia, on mafia groups. Um, and so they actually do this, uh, this work in Somalia um, and they find that pirates are protected by local clans in the Puntland region. So there is this, this connection between local governance uh, or lo local governing elites and pirates. Um, and pirates find local elites that actually can be bought off and local elites frequently want to be bought off because the resources that pirates provide them allow them to build things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to build uh, in the absence of piracy. So it provides certain resources, certain funds for them to invest back in the community. Um, and they actually look and see that there is this, this shift that is communities that can make more by taxing trade <laughs> tend to deny pirate sanctuary 
uh, but places in which you can make more from just the proceeds of piracy rather than taxing trade, you tend to provide uh, these pirates with sanctuary. And this actually can change over time. So it happened to be in the case that even in Puntland, there was a period of time during the height of the Somali-based piracy in which uh, pirates were making so much money and funneling this money into communities in the Puntland region that there was a benefit to local elites uh, for them uh, to, 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 to collude with these pirate action groups and these pirates. Uh, when that goes away as a result of increased policing, naval patrols, deterrence, a variety of other costs that were coming along, they actually shift their allegiance away from pirates. Piracy goes down. So uh, the, the, the kind of orthodox explanation that it was, in fact, naval missions that led to a decrease in piracy in the, in the greater Gulf of Aden uh, is, is probably not supported uh, empirically. It was, it was in, in part a, a, a uh, a, a function of, uh, of local elites that actually transformed or changed their allegiance. Um, in, in one of the other areas, so if we look, go back to Somalia. I don't have a map of Somalia, do I? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, if this is the Puntland region, this is Somaliland right here, which is, which is uh, uh, virtually independent of, uh, of, uh, of Somalia uh, itself, right? Uh, the major port, there aren't very many ports uh, in Somalia. Uh, I mean, it's so underdeveloped. Uh, there are simply very few urban centers. Uh, and in fact, if you look at like a, a map of nightlight emissions, I mean, there's, it's like North Korea. There's like no nightlights at all because there's very little uh, development that, that, that's in actually Somalia. But the major port of Somalia, other than Mogadishu, is actually Berbera. Um, and there was l much less piracy within the Somaliland region than there was in the Puntland region. There are no ports really in the Puntland region, but there was this port of Berbera, uh, which actually did uh, extensive trade. Uh, and so one of the explanations for why Somaliland didn't see as much piracy is in part because uh, of the revenue stream that came with, uh, with taxing uh, what was uh, imports and exports out of the Berbera port. Um, and um, you've seen that as well. Um, so... Um, there, there are these twin effects. So our interest is, is how do political institutions affect piracy, right? Um, so how does state capacity at the national level affect piracy, and how does state capacity or governing capacity at the local level affect, affect piracy? Um, and there are all these twin effects, right? So we're trying to understand what are the incentives of pirates? What are they looking for when they actually locate themselves within a region uh, or a country that would allow them to engage in this predatory criminal activity, this, uh, this, uh, this black market selling of stolen, uh, of stolen goods? Um, and so um, they, uh, there are these kind of countervailing effects um, that come with, with governing capacity. So in, in one sense, pirates... They need to find themselves a place in which there is infrastructure, as I talked about before, right? There, there is a need of a port. There, there is a need of communication equipment. There is a need of roads. Uh, there is, is a need for, for cargo to be off, uh, offloaded from ships uh, that, that might be berthed uh, in, uh, in, in ports as well. Uh, to, uh, there, there, there is a need for markets uh, to exist because they have to sell uh, this stolen material. Right? So in one sense, they want an area that actually is developed. Uh, there is governance. Right? Because this is where they actually can engage in this, elic this elic illicit activity. Right? But they also clearly are afraid of capture. Right? They're afraid of being apprehended by political authorities. Um, so the question is, is wh where do we find that, that, that sweet spot, that location in which there both is infrastructure in the absence of actually a strong, a, a strong, uh, uh, strong political officials, right? St a strong governing body uh, that actually has the resources and the manpower uh, to actually seek out, target, uh, and arrest, uh, and uh, incarcerate these individuals. Um, and we tend to find this in, uh, in, uh, in, weak, uh, in weak areas within countries, but not the weakest areas, right? So as we say, there is this, this, this it's like a business, so we obviously need markets infrastructure, but there obviously needs to be a place in which you can buy off these officials, right? You, you don't want a place in which there is the absence of, uh, of governance, the absence of political elites, because when there is, in fact, no governance, there usually is no infrastructure as well, right? Because you obviously need... Uh, a, a governing elite, a governing body to help develop the infrastructure of a, uh, of a local area. Um, so, and one of the things that you need in, in terms of, so I just wanted to go over these two. These are the two things we want to look at, right? Both markets and infrastructure and potential for collusion. That is, where are there political elites, that is, governing officials who can be bought off or bribed by pirates, 
right? And we think there is actually this, this, this intermediate area that is not the weakest areas of a country, not the strongest area of a country, uh, that actually uh, allows uh, uh, political elites to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be bribed by pirates uh, to allow for the scaling up of this sophisticated criminal activity uh, that these organized pirates uh, uh, actually represent, right? So we obviously have these markets and infrastructure that we need. Uh, there's obviously upfront investment in terms of boats, weapons, gas, and cash that's required for these pirates to engage in these attacks. Uh, there obviously is, uh, is the recruitment that needs to go on. That is how do you find individuals that are gonna engage in, uh, in pirate attacks? Um, and uh, a lot of this comes from local cafes and local restaurants in which you can find somebody who can be pulled out uh, and, and has uh, a sufficient skill or has a weapon that can be used uh, in a, uh, in a, seizure, of a uh, seizure of a ship, right? Obviously, you have the, the back end of the operation, which is once you have stolen this material, whatever it is, these goods, you need a place to sell it, right? You need a black market. So a lot of what we see in, in the Gulf of Guinea is what's called bunkering of oil. Obviously, there, there's, a, there's a ton of, uh, uh, of oil cargo ships and transport ships that are, car uh, that are carrying oil uh, from, uh, from markets uh, uh, in, in the, the Delta region of, of the Niger Delta, right? And so you can obviously pull up to either one of these offshore oil uh, facilities uh, or a tanker ship. Uh, you can hijack it in the Gulf of Guinea, 500 miles uh, off the coast of Nigeria. You can siphon off whatever, 10,000 uh, gallons of, uh, of oil, and then you need to find a black market, and there are plenty of places to do that, right? And you'll make hundreds of thousands of dollars. You do this in Indonesia as well, right? So one of the most recent attacks was against uh, what was a, a barge carrying uh, uh, crude palm oil, um, and they stole thousands of gallons of this crude palm oil. Um, and they made thousands and thousands of dollars off of that. And like I said, uh, the ships that were stolen off of, uh, off of Somalia were gigantic tanker ships, right? Now that's obviously unusual, but still you need a place to sell uh, these, uh, this, uh, this material, right? So clearly all of this is, uh, is, uh, is needed for piracy to actually be uh, effective. And then the, the other thing that it's needed is in these places, where there are political elites and where there are local communities, you need obviously the potential for collusion. So somehow you need to co-opt elites into supporting your, uh, your pirate operations, right? You need, to ha you need to find officials that can be bribed, right? And where can we find these? In the strongest places of a country, generally speaking, uh, you, it, it's harder to bribe these individuals because they're protected by national elites. They have the resource to actually fight back. Um, they aren't actually in, in fear of, uh, of what pirates can do or the pirate power because they themselves have uh, sufficient capabilities uh, to actually investigate and apprehend uh, pirates or criminals, right? In, like I said, in the weakest areas of a country, pirates don't want to be there because there's nothing uh, actually to, to steal or there's an infrastructure uh, to actually uh, offload uh, one's uh, stolen materials. So there is, a, 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 there is a, an area in between those two uh, in which elites are weak enough, they can be bought off. They don't have sufficient support from uh, the national state. The national state is not strong enough. They actually fear what would be repercussions for taking on pirates, right? And so in many of these places, uh, local elites, uh, they don't challenge pirates or, uh, or sophisticated organized criminal uh, uh, operations uh, or activities in part because they, they fear the cost to their own political positions of power. Uh, and so in many instances, they do collude. That is, they agree to, to be bribed by pirates um, uh, to avoid actually challenging them and, uh, and realizing that a fight uh, with pirates is, uh, is, is not going to be quite effective. Um, and so we need to find, our pirates need to find uh, elites that can actually be bribed. Uh, and of course, uh, the, for many of these places, there is actually community support. Historically, uh, we've seen this in, in, the, in, in the sense that uh, um, piracy provided benefits to the local areas in which pirates lived, right? They brought in what was cheap goods, um, and, uh, and so there was a benefit to the community itself. And the same thing with Puntland region. In fact, if you, if you look at uh, nightlight, sorry, if you look at satellite images of certain uh, local areas within the Puntland region before the height of Somali piracy and after the height of Somali piracy, you see extensive development that went on as a result of the funds that came in from piracy, right? There are new buildings, new structures, new roads, all kinds of new infrastructure development that actually came after 
uh, at the height of Somali piracy. So it clearly provides benefits to local communities. The communities themselves tend to support pirates um, uh, against what might be national government interests in eradicating them. Um, so anyhow, we, we see this, th this need is to find places in which uh, uh, local elites can actually be, uh, can be bribed or bought. So what this ends up doing is simply providing us with a two by two table in which we try to investigate this uh, empirically uh, at the sub-state level, right? So we want to know where opportunity for collusion are high is, and where presence of market and infrastructure are high. So we're mostly interested in this cell right down here. Where are these locations? Can we identify areas that have high opportunities for collusion as well as areas in which there is actually markets and infrastructure? Because this is where we should actually expect to see organized criminal activity uh, like, uh, like piracy. Obviously, these other areas, you can see it, but it tends to be opportunistic in nature, unorganized. Um, and we see this as, uh, a, as well, right? We actually have, uh, we actually can, um, can filter on whether or not that pirate attacks were against ships that were steaming out on the high seas, which requires a much more sophisticated operation, right? If most of us probably haven't tried to actually board a ship from a skiff <laughs> as it's moving at 50 knots um, uh, on the open water. It's not something that's simply easy to do, especially when there are countermeasures designed to keep you off the ship. Um, so it does require certain planning and certain organization. Um, and uh, typically, it requires funding by local bosses uh, that have some knowledge of, uh, of the ships that are being attacked. Uh, there may be some collusion between the ship captain and some boss and the pirates uh, themselves. In Indonesia, we certainly see connections between government officials. That is, the weapons from, from those pirates that actually have been apprehended, many of them have weapons that were uh, provided to them by Indonesian naval, uh, naval personnel. And so they actually are issued to uh, Indonesian Navy members who actually give them to uh, these, uh, these pirates. They're recruited from local cafes who then go use them in the attack. A successful attack, they come back and they actually uh, give them back to the, uh, to the, military, uh, to the military official. Um, my co-author actually went to the Riau Islands in Indonesia and asked pirates about where they got their weapons. And one of the things they reported is, of course, that they had these connections with local, uh, local uh, police uh, and military officials, personnel within these islands uh, who would support them in these, in these attacks, right? So there is high corruption, uh, and that corruption does vary, but certainly it was present in the Riau Islands uh, right off of, right off of, uh, of Singapore. All right, so we have these two empirical analyses that we're interested in, right? So we're interested in cross-national analysis, uh, and we're interested in sub-national analysis. Largely, we focus our sub-national analysis in Indonesia, although we back that up with some uh, analyses in Nigeria and analyses uh, in Somalia as well. We probably could do it in Bangladesh uh, too, but largely we focus on Indonesia uh, and then back that up with work in Nigeria, two countries that have experienced some of the most uh, the most piracy, globally speaking, over the last time, right? But we also have this uh, na cross-national hypothesis, right? So cross-nationally, we do expect there to be this aggregation problem, and so we expect this linear relationship between state capacity weakness and an increase in maritime pirate attacks, right? As countries become weaker nationally, we should see an increase in piracy. Sub-nationally, we, we expect to see this, in this, the, this inverted uh, this inverted U relationship, this curvilinear relationship, where initially piracy increases up to a certain point of development uh, or governance capacity, and then it actually decreases again, right? So we see a linear relationship cross-nationally. We actually see an inverted U relationship sub-nationally when we measure the relationship between governance and, uh, and, and pirate attacks or maritime piracy, right? So whatever. Cross-national research design, you know, we have these, uh, uh, an observation for each country for each year over a certain period of time. Um, we have data on piracy that's associated with each country based on where the pirate attack occurs, right? Um, uh, and so within uh, either the territorial waters or the exclusive economic zone of countries, right? So we can count the number of pirate attacks that occur by country by year, right? Globally speaking, for every single literal country uh, that exists uh, on the planet from 95 until this one is 2013, although as I said, we have piracy data in 2017, but some of the measures of our core right-hand side variables that we're interested in using to explain piracy, that data is limited temporally. Actually, it's limited spatially a little bit as well, right? Um, but basically, we're interested in this relationship. Where does piracy happen? And, what's, and basically, what's the strength of the state uh, within these countries, right? Uh, and our expectation is, as you decrease the strength of the state, you increase uh, the amount of piracy that we see. Uh, this actually, uh, we can see just with bivariate relationships, right? These are strong states moderately strong states or weak states, and then weak states, 
So as you decrease state capacity, you increase the amount of piracy. This is two different measures of, uh, of state capacity. So one is called the state, for sh state fragility index, and it looks at, at a variety of things regarding the, it's an index uh, that looks at the effectiveness and legitimacy of political institutions, actually political and economic institutions, to try to um, uh, create an, an index of weak stateness versus strong stateness. Uh, and if you were to look at it, so a zero actually is strong and 25 is weak. So Somalia is 25, or at least it's 25 for a number of years after the Barbary regime collapses. Um, the United States is in that two or three, actually all OECD countries are in that two or three uh, or one range. And then we have countries in the middle, uh, like a Malaysia and Indonesia or the Philippines. Most of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that are literal countries that experience maritime piracy are in that 16 to 17 to 18 to 19 range, so fairly weak states, uh, and they experience uh, a tremendous amount of piracy as well. And then we have this measure of relative political capacity, um, which actually looks at um, a tax extraction capacity of a country, so it actually compares a model uh, that predicts how much tax extraction a regime should have and compares that to how much taxes a country does actually uh, generate. Um, and so it, 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 the, the model actually looks at what are some of the industries that might generate revenue for a state, something like mining and, uh, and export, uh, export import duties, right, to get an idea of how much tax a state might develop based on those two industries. It actually looks uh, at things that the state would have to spend money on. If it's an OECD, uh, OECD country, it spends more just based on uh, public welfare benefits. It looks at how much health care spending there is. So it gets you a pretty good idea. And there's actually been a lot of work on, uh, on trying to assess how good these measures are. And a lot of people actually like this one uh, 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 quite a bit and think it actually is, is capturing what, what we're trying to capture in terms of really how, how strong these states are in terms of, uh, in terms of their ability to uh, control uh, territory. Um, so uh, whatever, I mean this, uh, uh, we basically find this, right? So at the subnational level, we basically have this linear relationship, right? As you, uh, as you increase extractive capacity, um, we find that uh, piracy drops. Uh, as you, uh, this is actually for all incidents, this isn't for steaming incidents, but generally speaking, whatever measure we use uh, for uh, state capacity at the at the national level, right? Not the subnational level, but the national level, we find that piracy. So, so the weakest states are associated with piracy, the strongest states have very little piracy, right? And it doesn't matter what estimator we use, doesn't matter if we use uh, an event count model, it doesn't matter if we use general estimate equation, it doesn't matter if we use a zero inflated uh, model, um, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever we find, it's always state weakness at the national level uh, does uh, produce uh, an increase in the amount of piracy. Now, of course, you might <laughs> suggest that both of these measures, actually, this is just one measure, this is just extractive capacity, but both extractive capacity and the state fragility, state fragility, state fragility index are endogenous to piracy, right? They are clearly connected to one another, right? So piracy goes up, state weakness goes down, and so obviously the effect can be, uh, can be reversed, and that obviously provides uh, a problem when it comes to inference. Uh, if uh, uh, if uh, it, it, it's having an endogenous relationship. So uh, although we do have different measures of state capacity and we have different measures of our other controls for grievance uh, and we use different estimators, so we try to, to get at this and get robustness, these results are in fact uh, strong, consistent uh, over time. One of the ways we try to get at this endogenous, uh, endogenous relationship is we actually f uh, found data that was from a, a paper um, that was published by the National Bureau of Economic Research um, that looked at the relationship between economic performance and political institutions. And they had the same problem, <laughs> that there's an endogenous relationship between economic performance and political institutions, right? It goes both ways. So they wanted to find uh, what was um, a measure of political institutions that was clearly exogenous to economic performance. And what they used was um, colonial mortality rates uh, which is, I thought was super interesting. And so we use this data as well. And basically it collects data on the mortality rates of, uh, of, uh, of soldiers and sailors and, and religious personnel that actually went to European colonies in Sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and South America and Southeast Asia. Um, and it uses that as a proxy for basically political institutions. Um, so basically there were two types of states, they argue. There were states that were extractive 
right? Because the mortality rates were very high, and so settlers knew the mortality rates were very high, and so people didn't go there for long periods of time. They didn't invest in infrastructure. They didn't invest in political institutions. They went there, and they took stuff out, and they sent it back to uh, the home country, right? So there wasn't this investment in institutional structures. But then there were countries in which mortality rates were much lower, and actually colonizers went there, and they lived there. That is, they took the, their families there, and they, uh, and they exported themselves and their communities to these places, and in the process, they actually developed what were economic, uh, economic and political institutions uh, that, uh, that would last the test of time. There actually were checks on government uh, on authority. They were concerned about transparency and corruption. And so we have these two types of institutions, one that produced very corrupt uh, institutions that, that were produced by the, extra the extractive industries, and then these uh, communities in which individuals uh, went there to live uh, and produce what were more transparent. Uh, and more uh, and more power was checked, and so anyhow, if we use this measure of uh, of mortality rates, uh, we find the exact same relationship, right? So this being exogenous to maritime piracy, uh, we also and using it as, as a proxy of uh, what is governance, we find the same relationship. All right, so we're more interested now <laughs> in what are the subnational effects, right? Because people had looked cross-nationally and, and, and found this relationship between state capacity uh, and maritime piracy, but nobody had done uh, what was kind of systematic empirical work at the sub-national level to associate whether or not we could get a measure of sub-national governance and whether that was in, in some way associated with where we see maritime piracy. Um, and so we do this in Indonesia with these qualitative, uh, quantitative analysis, which I'll describe, and then we, um, my co-author did this I wouldn't call it a qualitative analysis, but she went actually to the Rio Islands, as I said. She actually did these 20 structured interviews with former pirates and journalists and others who were interested or engaged in, uh, in, in piracy or study of piracy over there. And so it's not really a test of our argument. It really is, uh, it's, uh, it's information that, uh, that allows us uh, to see whether our argument is plausible, that people on the ground actually were behaving as if our model uh, as if the, our model was true, right? Our model suggests this is the way they behave, and actually, when we interview them, the things that they actually mention and talk about actually do connect back to many of the factors that we associate with in our quantitative analyses that we're trying to measure, right? Um, <laughs> didn't know I had that in there. All right, so this looks at, um, at piracy. Uh, I didn't do this. Just, oh, sorry, just in Indonesia, right? So this is what it looks like in Indonesia over time. Right, so we actually see ups and downs, and we can actually associate these with certain events that are happening. There obviously was the financial crisis that happened in 1997. Uh, there actually was, uh, 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 that produced an increase uh, in the amount of piracy we see. There was the collapse of the Sohada regime in 1998. Um, so we have a variety of things we can actually see associated with piracy events that are happening on, uh, on the ground. But this is not what, what it looks like in Indonesia, not globally speaking, but in Indonesia over time for the period that we're looking at, right, 95 to 2015, 2016. Okay. So the way we want to test this, and, and, and as I said, um, people have tried to get at the subnational, uh, this um, the subnational relationship, that is, people have suggested that there may be a curved linear relationship uh, between governance and maritime piracy, but they haven't yet um, empirically measured governance at the subnational level to actually see whether there is an association between a measure of subnational governance and uh, a measure of uh, subnational piracy. Um, and so what we, what we try to do is um, we actually grid out what is Indonesia or the uh, EEZ, the economic the exclusive economic zone of Indonesia into these 55 by 55 kilometer grid cells. Um, and obviously these, <laughs> one of the problems that one confronts in doing work uh, on piracy is that um, the events that we're interested in studying happen on the water, but the causes of those events that happen on the water actually are on land, right? So somehow we have to associate things that are on land with things that are happening on the water, right? Um, and this becomes a real, a real challenge. And as we'll talk about, we do it in two different ways. So we create these 55, this grid cell uh, within the EEZ, again, water grid cells, right? Um, and we can then populate that with pirate attacks. We can lay over a shape file of piracy on top of that, grid fi uh, on top of that shape file of grids, uh, and we can count the number of piracy incidents within each of those grid cells, right? We then have to create um, uh, what are uh, uh, basically 
uh, we have to expand out or we have to carry out the values on land of the closest municipal locations uh, to these grid cells on water, right? So we actually buffer these values out um, to, these, to these grid cells. Um, and initially what we, we've done, although we've done both account of these incidents, but we've also done, uh, uh, we've dummied this out, which is what I'm gonna show you, just that the grid cell had piracy, it's a one, but didn't have piracy, it's a zero, right? Uh, we've done that and we've done uh, counts uh, as, uh, as well, right? So we create these buffers around uh, the locations of our measures of governance on land, and we buffer those out to the, uh, to the uh, actual grid cells on the water, right? So uh, as I said, we have, a, we have a measure of this, <laughs> comes from our data set that we've created, right, on piracy counts, and we have those geolocated, so we can count those easily into grid cells. Obviously, measuring governance is not easy to do, right? So this becomes the challenge, is what can we use to measure governance at the subnational level? And so one of the things that is available uh, it's available both locally and it's available over time locally is actually mean nightlight emissions, right? So we have data um, uh, which is uh, uh, basically high quality, um, fine data of satellite uh, pictures of, uh, of all of Indonesia uh, on how much nightlight emissions there are across these, across the grid cell. And actually there is, there is a data set that was put together by the Peace Re Research Institute of Oslo uh, that actually compiles that nightlight emission data into grid cells on land. So we have these grid cells on land, and we have, we have data on nightlight emissions. Right, and so the question is, is, is that a valid measure of what we want, which is governance? Right, is that a good measure of what we're trying to get at? Um, and uh, we hope it is. <laughs> we actually, we, we correlate that with a variety of other measures as well. So. Um, uh, one of the reasons that we might use it, right, is that we could get data on municipal tax extraction, although it's spotty, <laughs> it's not as useful, right? But of course, there is an interest, potentially, that the government that actually reports data on municipal tax extraction uh, or tax revenues doesn't know what it actually is and they make up the numbers or the data is wrong, right? So there's, there's some possibility that that data is actually being corrupted uh, in the collection process, right? So this at least likely is not that. Right? So at least we avoid that problem with these satellite, with these satellite images. Right? It also makes sense to think of where we see nightlights is a place where the state is investing in capacity. Right? That is, infrastructure is associated, or nightlights are associated with where infrastructure is, uh, um, and so this is where the state wants to be. Actually, it may be a place where you, you, the state wants to invest because of national security reasons. Right? So they build roads out because this is a place uh, in which uh, in which uh, we need to defend against what are potential uh, external threats. Uh, so th there, there are good reasons to think that it is a valid measure conceptually of governance, where we see nightlights as where the state likely is, right? Now, of course, it doesn't change much over time, although most measures of governance don't change much over time, so it doesn't really matter what measure we use, but nightlights clearly don't change much over time. They're fairly static, um, right? And it, it, it also, it, <laughs> It, is it a measure of, of infrastructure or is it a measure of governance? And both of those things were kind of interested, right? They were interested in both where there, there's infrastructure and where there are opportunities for collusion, right? And, um, and so we, we are, well, <laughs> we use it as a representation of both, right? We can't distinguish them right now, although if we use something else, so we actually do have, we, we do have data on roads subnationally, so I can just count the number of roads that exist within a grid cell or the amount of, uh, the amount of miles of roads within a grid cell, and those things also associate in the exact same way as nightlights, right? I think we have, we actually, yeah, so we do have tax extraction. This is what it looks like in terms of nightlight emissions uh, uh, run against what is tax extraction, and it looks pretty decent. Uh, in terms of if we think that tax extraction is a measure of governance um, at the local level, then maybe nightlight emissions is actually capturing that uh, as well. As I said, road counts also associate um, uh, with, uh, with mean nightlights. And so what we, what we use right now is, is mean nightlights to get at whether or not, what, what the level of governance is within these, within these local communities. Um, let's see. All right. So this is what it kind of looks like in terms of, you can see nightlight emissions. These are the grid cells on land, right? I actually didn't, I didn't show a map of the grid cells on water, but we would have these similar grid cell boxes on water too. 
uh, and we would count the number of piracy incidents, and then we would buffer these, these grid cells out. But intuitively, there is this, you know, where we see piracy happens to be closer to areas in which there are uh, some nightlight emissions. Um, but again, our expectation is that uh, there should be no piracy or very little piracy where there are no nightlights, and there should be not very much piracy where there are the strongest or the most nightlights, but it happens someplace in the middle. This is a place where there both is, uh, is infrastructure that can be used for pirate attacks and the, the selling of these illicit goods that have been stolen, but also weak enough that elites can be purchased or bought by pirates, uh, and so that's where pirates themselves are going to locate. Um, and so we expect to see this curve linear relationship when we associate either the probability that a grid cell will have piracy or the number of pirate events and uh, uh, basically a, uh, a, uh, a squared measure of, uh, of nightlights. And so this is a, it's actually hard to see the error bars, but still we do find this subnationally within Indonesia. It's a really nice relationship. Um, again, as you low nightlight emissions, very little piracy, high nightlight emissions, very little piracy, it does happen in the middle. Uh, so there is this sweet spot in which pirates are gravitating towards, right? If we actually uh, filter on the type of piracy that we see, be it piracy against steaming ships versus piracy against uh, uh, attacks against ships that are anchored, so basically armed robbery at sea, um, we would expect it to be stronger, which we do see for what is piracy against ships that are steaming. It's not nearly as strong. Uh, it's almost non-existent for what would be more opportunistic piracy, which is what you'd expect, right? Opportunistic piracy is more like kind of local crime, um, opportunistic uh, in nature, and so it can happen anywhere. But where you need sophisticated organized piracy, the place that that, that can be successful is a place where you can scale up and involve, actually involves uh, uh, significant infrastructure development that actually enables uh, pirate action groups to uh, succeed. So we do tend to see this uh, strong relationship against what are these um, more uh, coordinated uh, sophisticated pirate attacks. Um, okay, uh, so uh, lastly, so that's our quantitative analysis, and lastly, and I'll end with this, uh, my co-author went to the Rio Islands, um, which is, again, this is, I don't know where the line is here, but there's a, a line here that divides Indonesia uh, from, uh, and Malaysia from, which is uh, uh, Indonesia, um, so Singapore and uh, Malaysia from Indonesia, and so she was actually on uh, uh, these islands here doing, uh, doing interviews, um, and, and basically, this actually, again, th there's a lot of piracy that comes in, in these areas. Um, and, uh, and so she went here just to talk to individual pirates. Um, and so there are these, th these uh, semi-structured interviews that involve both pirates, but also community leaders and journalists um, about what, uh, why piracy was happening. And she asked a variety of questions. So has the pirate group come together? And of course, the answer was is that you know, somebody knows somebody, <laughs> and that's how you get selected into a pirate action group. Um, so there's some connection. Uh, you know, if you have a weapon, uh, then you might be somebody who uh, the, uh, a pirate group would want to connect to. Uh, if you're a friend of somebody that's engaged in piracy, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're somebody connecting. So it, it obviously came locally uh, from local communities, uh, uh, local facilities, uh, uh, and individuals that have engaged in piracy before. Um, playing the operation, there clearly was a boss. And this is, again, Indonesia in the Rio Islands. There was somebody who was paying up front for the boat, for the gas, right? For all the things that you might need to engage in a pirate attack, they obviously would get a cut, right? So all the things that one might need was coming from a certain individual. Uh, we actually see a, a relatively large increase in piracy. So there's this big decrease uh, when there's some joint naval patrols and, uh, um, and the resolution of the Acha conflict uh, on Sumatra uh, in the early 2000s. So there's a big decrease in piracy in, in Indonesia, but it, it, it dramatically increases in the, in, in the latter half of the, of the first decade in, 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 uh, of, uh, of the 21st century, and a lot of that was because you get these bosses from Malaysia and actually Vietnam, maybe even China as well, uh, that actually have a lot of money and are funding these operations and they're connected to uh, maybe uh, uh, to captains on some of these oil ships uh, that are that are transiting through uh, these uh, 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 these choke points like the Malacca Straits, right? So they're obviously somebody who actually has the resources to fund these operations, and they obviously get a cut. Um, now realize that that. You know, the probability of becoming a victim of uh, an attack of piracy is still extremely, extremely small, right? So th there are 100, 120,000 ships that go through the Malacca Straits every year, 
and they're somewhere in the range of, you know, 85 attacks against ships, and maybe 14 attacks against steaming, against steaming ships, right? So the probability of any individual ship becoming a, a victim of piracy is really, really, really low, right? And so that does explain to a certain extent why there hasn't been a concerted effort in some parts of the world to actually uh, address piracy, because it, it's, it's still extremely, extremely rare. Um, and uh, for many communities, local communities, there is a benefit in terms of the resources that are, that, uh, that are accrued uh, from these operations. Um, you know, we know, as I said, there's, there's corruption. Can, got, can uh, you know, where do you get these weapons? You can get it from a soldier uh, or a sailor from the Indonesian, Indonesian Navy. What happens after? Obviously, there are black markets everywhere. Uh, and so we, we have a connection to somebody who has black market. We can sell the stolen oil uh, to this individual. So all of these things. A, a boss at the beginning uh, funds this operation. Individuals are recruited from local cafes. Uh, and, and, and lo local restaurants, local communities. Uh, there obviously uh, is, is a, a boat that's provided, there are weapons that's provided, there's collusion with, uh, with local elites uh, that allow this operation to take place. Um, there actually is a, a black market that happens after, and, and in the sense that's all planned out as well, uh, in the sense that there, there, is, uh, there is somebody who's gonna, who's gonna, uh, who's gonna buy whatever you've, uh, whatever you've stolen, and then those resources flow back into the, flow back into the community, right? Um, and so what are the implications in terms of what we found out? And, and as I said, we, we did the same grid analysis in Nigeria, same curve linear relationship. We do the grid analysis in Somalia, same curve linear relationship. It's weaker in Somalia in part because there's so little development in Somalia, and so the, the, the difference between a high nightlight area and a low nightlight area is really small. They're all low nightlight areas uh, in Somalia, but still there's generally a curve linear relationship we find in Somalia as well. As I said, we used... Um, water grid cells and we buffer out land values, but we also use land grid cells. We actually measure the distance, inverted distance, actually to where piracy is happening. And even using that type of, um, uh, of research design, the save, save, same curve linear relationship. So dependent variable is actually different. It's not a count of piracy, actually, it's actually distance to piracy. And what you see again is, uh, is piracy is closer to areas in this intermediate range of, uh, of nightlight emissions or governance capabilities, right? Um, and so one of the things that, that, we, that, we, that we really find in this is that, it, one, better policing on land makes it, but local governance really matters. And there are these counter, uh, countervailing effects that might come from strengthening local governance. I mean, strengthening national governance may not, may not decrease piracy, uh, at least in the short term, right? But one, it's hard to change uh, governance at the national level, and so it, it would have to be over a long period of time. Uh, but even at the local level, one of the things that many countries get as a result of weak governance conditions uh, is they actively seek aid from Western countries. And one of the things that aid tends to provide is, although it can actually provide, um, it, can, it can provide a source of revenue for local elites that is different from piracy, and so could allow them to, uh, to opt not to take uh, money from pirates uh, and avoid that, uh, that collusion relationship and take it from, uh, to, from Western donors. But one of the things it also does is that actually that, that money can actually allow development to happen, which becomes attractive to pirate action groups. So you actually build up areas that previously were too weak for pirates. They actually weren't attractive uh, for, uh, for these, types of criminal, these types of criminal activities. The aid flows in and actually builds roads. It builds communication facilities. It builds financial uh, institutions. That then becomes attractive uh, for, for, uh, for pirates. And in fact, again, there was a lot of money that flowed into Mogadishu. And if you actually look at peacekeeping operations, in Mogadishu, piracy actually moved down from Puntland toward Mogadishu at the height uh, of Somali piracy, in part because peacekeeping operations actually stabilized what was the environment uh, around Mogadishu, which became more attractive or more appealing uh, for pirate action groups. And so they actually gravitate towards the peacekeeping operations rather than away from peacekeeping operations. Uh, now, in part, peacekeeping operations weren't, weren't going to engage these pirate action groups. That wasn't their mandate. Uh, but still, we see that, uh, uh, that uh, stability uh, and infrastructure development does tend to be appealing to uh, pirates. And then lastly, you know, we have this, a lot of effort on counter piracy, but if you address piracy, and, and actually we got this from our, our, our interviews as well, um, I mean, somebody went from pirate, being a pirate to making fake passports, right? So when piracy got to be uh, difficult or not as, uh, as lucrative, they just shifted their criminal activity to something else, right? So it's not clear that uh, counter piracy operations are going to are uh, eliminate what would be all criminal activity, right? It just may shift from one area 
to another. Uh, and actually, one of the things we're interested in is trying to uh, get measures of other criminal activities to see if piracy and governance, sorry, if other, criminal, if other measures of criminal activity move with governance just like piracy does. Um, uh, we don't have cross-national data on that, and somebody hasn't really looked cross-nationally at that very much, but that would be interesting just to see if we can actually find additional support. All right, uh, I've gone on way too long, but I'll stop. <laughs> I'll stop right there. <laughs> so. <clears throat> and I'll take, if there are questions, easy to go on for a long time. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about the governance, but not about governance on land, which is outside of piracy, but about governance on sea, which is inside mm. the piracy. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, when I was listening to you, uh, I was remembering uh, the famous book, The Complete History of Piracy, but Uncle Skinstam, I think you're familiar with it. And he quoted there extremely interesting document, which was a pirate code of so-called so golden age, it's early 18th century, how the piracy community was organized. And I remember that I was amazed in some sense, in some sense shocked that I realized that it was that time. I'm speaking about political or social organization within the piracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was much more democratic than on land, while authorities at that time, governors, vice governors, and so were appointed, all the hierarchy, by King in London yeah. or by some local authorities. All authorities on board, on piracy ships, were elected. Yeah. The captain, the quartermaster, all the officers, and so So My question is that when, we, when you speak about the contemporary piracy near Somalia or Malacca or Nigeria, what about this social self-organization? I would say it's sort of self-government that we can yeah, yeah. use, apply this. Yeah. Uh, is it sort of, could we say that it's more democratic than on land? Because you are saying, you were saying that, you know, there is sort of correlation between piracy and uh, at least at that locals and the civil wars. And civil wars mean what? Destruction, political, social destruction in the government, not only in the government, in the country, and the economy yeah. and so on. Is there any correlation here? And what about self-organization and this uh, democratic or whatever foundations, the grounds for pirates nowadays? And uh, follow up is, if so, did you count that factor in your analysis? Did you include this social self-organization self -organization on sea, on board, within the Paris in your models? Thank you. Yeah, no, f thanks. So uh, the, um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, that is, uh, there, there is, there is little information on the organizational structure and the membership lists of pirate action groups. We simply, we don't know. That is, cross-nationally, it's hard even to find data exactly on where the pirate, uh, the pirate organization, who heads it up, and how many people are, are part of it. There's no code published yet. So nothing yet. I mean, we would, part of the project was designed to try to get some data on pirate groups. And what we wanted to know was just basic information. Where are the pirate groups located? So geographically. And then what's an, what's an idea of the number of people that are in these pirate groups? Those are just two pieces of information. And we couldn't get, we couldn't find that out. That is, we could ask, I mean, we tried to interview what were people on the ground in a variety of countries, not that were pirates, but were people who studied piracy, that had looked at piracy for a long period of time. And the, the, uh, uh, the amount of difference between what people said about where pirate groups were located and how many members was extremely huge. We had no confidence in the data that we gleaned, that we got from these, from these online interviews of people who studied piracy. Yeah. This guy, he was a pirate, he said, this boss, they came, he provided us the foil, the boat, yeah. and how he feel. Yeah. They elected them, he was appointed by some Yeah, yeah. He just on the road. Yep. No so, so uh, we don't know that information yet. I mean, again, we have, uh, uh, we have a few studies that have looked just a little bit on, on where these individuals come from, where they're recruited from, how many are there, what happens. Generally, it, it happens that it's not the same people every time, that you go to a cafe and... 
you get four or five or six or seven people. In fact, I think that the average number of people in a pirate attack is somewhere between five and 10. Um, and so you can, you can get different five and 10 people uh, at different times um, and they're given the money. And, but I don't know anything about whether there's a certain leader other than the boss. Who that boss is, I don't know. What resources is, I don't know. Where he's from, I don't know. Um, and whether or not there's a certain profile of individual, I'm not exactly sure about, other than that they are usually poor individuals uh, within th these, uh, these local communities and areas in which pirate ships, sorry, in areas in which uh, there actually is heavy traffic. Um, so I don't know more about it. We would love to know more about that, but there's been few studies on, on, on that. Now we do know that there is certainly a relationship between rebellion or armed insurgency and, and, and pirates. Um, and it, it certainly is the case um, that one of the reasons you see the emergence or the onset of rebellion is because the state, the national state, is repressive. It doesn't do its job very well. It doesn't govern very well. Uh, and so what emerges is a challenge to that governing authority. And much of this happens in what were formal colonial states, right? Because the government that was left by the colonizer already was distrusted. It was already believed to be corrupt. Uh, and so there are many places within a country that simply didn't like that organization and actually wanted to govern themselves. Uh, and so you have... The it is their own state, but it, but it came, that is the problem with these colonial states is that yes, I mean the colonizers left and local indigenous individuals took over the structure of that government, began to run it, but it already had a flavor of being colonial. And so it already, it, it, it was born illegitimate, right? In many of these places, local communities saw that government as being part of what was the former colonizer and repressive. And so we do see that the, there are these uh, emerging actors that challenge the national state uh, in part because it's repressive, because it doesn't deliver services very well, and, and pirates uh, both flow in and out of these insurgent communities. They both are fighters, and they're paid to be fighters, but they also are pirates, uh, and they actually use those pirate proceeds to actually fund the rebellion itself, and they actually, again, might get rich themselves uh, off of being pirates, but we don't really, we know a little bit more about the organization of rebellion than we do the organization of piracy. So there's, there's, you know, there's some findings that we might have with the organization of rebellion, that might associate or help us to understand the organization of pirates. But right now we have very little data on the organization of pirate groups. Yeah. So I noticed in one of your early slides there was a bar chart of the uh, uh, instances of piracy and I noticed that it went down a lot in like 2013 or something like that. Um, and I just wondered if you had any explanation for what would cause that decrease in piracy? Um, so yeah, it looks like 2012, 2013, it decreases. Is there a shift in the governance in the locations that had high piracy or is there some other explanation? Yeah, so uh, there obviously is, there is this, this is the height of Somali piracy and Somali piracy does in part go away because of what was an international response to the piracy problem in the West Indian Ocean, Gulf of Aden, right? So there are three naval operations that actually are authorized to address specifically only piracy uh, within the greater Gulf of Aden. So one is by NATO, one is by the EU, and one is an international uh, naval operation, right? So there is this concerted effort to address it with naval forces, so coercive capacity, policing on the ocean. Now again, I mean, it's a huge sea, so it doesn't, you know, you might say it doesn't really matter, but along the Gulf of Aden, uh, and uh, there, it's narrower and so you can actually do something about it there. But the other thing that happens in part uh, as a result of the, the Somali piracy is that there are these best, manage best management practices that are put on board ships that are transiting the waters and so they steam faster around piracy areas, they avoid piracy areas, they put razor wire around uh, the, uh, the ship itself, harder to get on, they have these huge cannons that shoot water, right? They have night lights, they have these acoustic devices that can actually blow out your ears and things like this. So they have a whole bunch of, uh, of countermeasures. They put armed guards uh, on ships as well. So it became increasingly costly for pirates to get these ships. Uh, and so one of the, one of the explanations is that this, these two responses uh, decreased the value of attacking these ships, right? There was more value uh, uh, doing something on land, finding some other, uh, other employment. Um, now again, in part perhaps as a result of both that and efforts to eliminate what was IUU fishing. And so there wasn't, so the Somali state does strengthen after 2000, 
I don't know, seven, eight, nine, it become, it increasingly gets stronger, has greater control. There actually are some ability to actually now prevent uh, foreign fishing fleets from entering the Somali waters. So people who were engaging in piracy could flow back into fishing. Um, and actually, if you look, one of the, uh, you know, we, we can use GDP per capita as a measure of grievance. GDP per capita goes up, of course, piracy goes down. GDP per capita goes down, piracy goes up. We can also use a measure of uh, the value of aquacultural production um, within countries' waters, um, and that change does relate to piracy. So as the value of fish stock does go up, piracy does go down. We found that cross-nationally, but somebody did some work at the sub-national level in Indonesia and also found that. So the, the value of fishing does lead to a decrease in piracy because, again, people who are the most likely people to engage in piracy are people who have boat handling skills, have gauged on the water and stuff. And so, uh, and so there, there are these multiple events that are going on that led to the, the decrease um, in someone at this period of time. Now, actually, 2015, actually 2016 and 2017, there has to be an increase. So small piracy has not gone away, despite the fact that it was, it's been treated as, uh, as going away. Uh, there's now been an increase in part because some of the naval operations have actually now ended. Um, the EU uh, 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 re-upped its naval operation, but I think for a year. But again, uh, you know, one naval operation has like, has like eight ships or seven ships. I mean, it's a huge area it has to police. Um, so it's more important for things on land uh, to go well, and it depends a little bit on how conditions are going on land um, that determines it. So certainly the Somali state strengthened, IUU fishing was decreased, uh, and that contributed to a decrease in piracy as well. Um, you had mentioned the ransoms that are paid uh, sometimes to pirates. I was wondering who function as the intermediaries for the ransom payment, whether it's the corrupted officials that you mentioned or are some sort of transnational actor. Um, so one of, the, one of the interesting things is that piracy didn't go away in part because um, shipping companies didn't necessarily have an incentive to address it because they had insurance that took care of these ransoms. And so it was, o it was only when insurance companies were forking out a lot of money that the international community, uh, along with some of these high profile attacks, became interested because they were forking out $2 million, $3 million, whatever, right? Um, so companies themselves didn't have to pay these things, so they weren't necessarily interested in uh, addressing it. Um, now again, uh, as piracy goes up, insurance rates do go up, and they become, uh, they become somewhat concerned about that. But initially, uh, it was insurance companies that were, that were paying off. But yes, is there a middleman? Yes. Um, and it's usually somebody on the ground. In fact, interestingly enough, there was an individual um, in Somalia itself who was a pirate <laughs> who engaged in extensive piracy and made a tremendous amount of money um, from pirate attacks. Um, and once the naval operations uh, became authorized, and all three of them, I think, became authorized in late 2008, 2009, and at that period of time, this individual who was engaging in extensive piracy uh, he saw the handwriting on the wall and decided that he was now going to be a counter piracy operator. And so he became an informant, uh, a, 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 an analyst, right, uh, for uh, the counter piracy missions. He, he would actually help them uh, to understand where pirates were going uh, and, uh, and how much piracy they were engaged in. He would actually help negotiate uh, for a while what the ransom rewards are between pirates and uh, these international insurance uh, companies uh, as well. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, he, he was, um, because he had engaged in extensive piracy, the international community really wanted him, and they convinced him that they were going to make a movie about him, <laughs> and so they flew him to Belgium, and he was going to go there and meet with movie executives and a variety of things about this movie that was going to be made about his life, and it was, of course, a ruse, and, they, and of course, when he landed and got off the plane, authorities actually were there to intercept him. So he thought he was going there to actually to advise some movie production company about, about his life, and they actually seized him. But so many times there are former pirates that engage in this middleman process, or there's somebody with the insurance company that actually ha is an expertise or has engaged in these types of actions that actually goes on the ground uh, and, uh, and, and engages what are these pirates on the ground. Now, again, it's only Somalia, right? I mean, that was the, there's no other place really in which that happened. Right, piracy is different in, uh, in Indonesia. It wasn't, I mean, the problem with, with Somalia is that there's no place to actually put the ship. I mean, usually what you would do is you would just take the stuff off the ship. You'd siphon it off, you would sell it someplace else, and you could do that at a port, but there are no ports in, 
uh, in Somalia. So the type of piracy that ended up developing in Somalia because of the absence of development and ports was that you just take the ship, you run it on land, uh, and then you either ransom off the ship itself or you kidnap the sailors and you ransom them off, right? But in Nigeria, you, you actually hold a ship, you siphon off the oil, you go sell it on the black market. In Indonesia, most of it's opportunistic, uh, armed robbery on ships in ports, or it's the same kind of siphoning of, uh, of, uh, of oil off of, off of vessels. Um, and so Somalia was different only because level of development and infrastructure uh, was, so, was so different compared to others. So the type of piracy uh, uh, was different in Somalia. But yes, pirates were the intermediaries or people who worked for the insurance companies were intermediaries that actually helped these, uh, these negotiations go through.